On behalf of Pastor Phil and the family of Believer's Christian Church, we are excited to sow this message into your life. Our mission at Believer's is to love God, love people, and serve both. Our prayer is that through this message, you will receive revelation that will bring a lasting change into your life. To find out more about us, log on to BelieversChristianChurch.com. Normally I start out with a, uh, a joke, but I'm going to get right into the message because I just I don't think it's appropriate for, us to, uh, for me to go that direction. Not saying that we need to be somber, but I just want to get into the message. If you have your Bible, turn with me to Luke, the 17th chapter. We have been on a series, A Fresh Start, and this morning we're going to pick that back up when we talk about forgiveness. Truly having a fresh start in your life has to include forgiveness. The unforgiveness that often is harbored in our lives, I am personally convinced now that it is the primary, at least one of the primary reasons that we don't see the joy, the flow of God, the blessing of God in our lives because of the blockage that comes from unforgiveness. If you were to ask me a couple months ago uh, my opinion on forgiveness or unforgiveness, my response would have been much harsher. Uh, I would have said, what's wrong with you? You know, if you have received Jesus and you, you understand forgiveness, why on earth is it so difficult for you to forgive someone else? And recently the Lord reminded me of something that happened to us here, me personally in the church. Uh, some time ago, a couple years ago, somebody had their, uh, their feelings hurt. Uh, they were offended. And this person, uh, it started out real hot for God, excited for what God was doing, was uh, talking, you know, we're going to die together. We're going to live forever together. We're, we're going to serve in the ministry together. It's all this. And then an offense came. And when they got offended, they, they didn't just move on. They tried to muddy the waters. They tried to uh, create a division. They began to spread lies and say things that weren't true and uh, tried to hurt the work of God instead of just moving on. And I knew in my heart I had to protect my heart not to be uh, unforgiving. And so I, 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 to the best of my ability, I forgave them and, and let it go. And then, uh, you know, I told you, if you would ask me a couple months ago, how would my response have been about what's your problem on, on forgiving people? The Lord turned it back around on me. And this is how it happened. The person that did all those things, which were wrong, they were bad, they shouldn't have done it. I caught word that things in their life weren't going good. I heard that things were going bad. You know, what, you want to know what my emotion was? I was happy. I'm ashamed of that. I'm embarrassed of that. But I'm, I'm going to lead the way this morning in saying that, listen, forgiveness or holding on to unforgiveness is not for the novice only. We're going to see that even the apostles were taken back on how difficult it must be, this, char this charge that God has on us to drop the charges to forgive. And so... The only way that we're going to have an effective time in God this morning is if he does a work in our hearts. Because across this room, there is so much self-justification as to why you feel the way you do, why you're harboring unforgiveness. That many of you are as excited about spring and summer as I am. Some of you like to garden. Some of you like to put flowers in. Uh, some of you are farmers. But anyone who understands planting and seeds is you, you never go out to a garden or you go out to your flower bed or the farmer never goes out to their field and just scatters seed on top of the ground that's not been turned over and worked over. It would just sit there on top. And so we need the Holy Spirit. Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes into the Father except through me. In John 6, he says that no one comes to the Father lest he draws them. We are drawn to the Father by the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit to do a work, a preparation in our hearts this morning so that we would receive the Word of God this morning. So do this with me. Would you put your hand on your heart and just close your eyes? Holy Spirit, we need you this morning. We need you to do a prepping of our hearts. Help us to make ourselves available to you that if surgery is needed, that we make ourselves available. Moments of honesty where we need to be real about what we're facing, what we're thinking, what we're feeling. But more than that, we would receive revelation. Not just to receive a good message today, and not just to leave here thinking a little bit different for a season, but that this would be the initiation of something that would reside within us, unfolding within us, that would grow within us for the remainder of our lives. Help us to see the love that you have toward us. And as a response, we really can love others. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. You're already there. Luke chapter 17. Let me catch up with you. 
This is Jesus speaking to a group of mature believers, the highest of authority, second only to Jesus, the apostles. Um, I think someone took Luke out of my Bible. Thank you. Luke 17, verse number one. Then he said to the disciples, it is impossible that no offenses should come. Say that with me. It is impossible that no offenses should come. But woe to him through whom they do come. Jesus, when Jesus says something, I think it's worth perking our ears up. Can I get an agreement on that? That Jesus is saying, listen, folks, this isn't a bad confession. This is a reality. It is impossible, impossible for you not to get offended, not to have offenses come. But it would be better for him, verse number two, if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea, that he should offend one of these little ones. Take heed to yourselves, govern yourselves, manage yourselves, be mindful for yourself. Take heed of yourselves or to yourselves. If your brother sins against you, rebuke him. Don't be quiet about it. Don't sweep it under the rug. Don't, don't try to, to bury it thinking it's going to go away. Confront it. Say it. Bring it up. Bring it to the surface. Don't, that doesn't mean you have to have a fight. It doesn't have to mean you have to be mean. You have to respond in evil. But you have to speak up. Share it. Don't, don't just tuck it away and think it's going to go, go somewhere eventually. No, it'll come back. And it's going to wreck your life. Rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if, if he sins against you seven times in a day, and seven times in a day returns to you saying, I repent, you shall forgive him. And the apostles said, now remind you, in this conversation, Jesus is talking about forgiveness. He's talking about offenses. These are the apostles. And this is their response to a simple conversation about forgiveness. They said, Lord, increase our faith. What does faith have to do with forgiveness? Well, we're going to look at that. Verse number six, so the Lord said, if you have faith as a mustard seed, if I were to stop right there and you looked up and I said, finish the rest of what Jesus is going to say, many of us would say, speak to that mountain. We talk a lot about speaking to mountains around here, but that's not the, the word he uses. He says, you can say to this mulberry tree or sycamine tree, depending on what version or translation you have, be pulled up by the roots and be planted in the sea and it would obey you. Now, one of the reasons I think we struggle to forgive, drop the charges, and let things go is because we don't understand the magnitude of the level by which we've been forgiven. And Jesus addresses this a couple of different times, and I'm going to look at two, two analogies, two parables that Jesus gives when it comes to understanding the value of which you and I have received this grace. So number one, let's go back just a couple chapters and go back in Luke chapter 7. And Jesus is has been invited to dinner, to have a meal with a Pharisee. Now, I can't find another example where a Pharisee invited Jesus in to have dinner with him. And, you know, we take it for granted just having meals. I mean, we, we eat on the fly. We eat in our cars. We eat at our office desk. We, we eat everywhere. Well, having a meal in this day was much more important to them. It was ours. They lounged. They fellowshiped. It was communion. It was intimate. I mean, it would be like, I don't know what to compare it other than, listen, it was more than just, let's have dinner. And so Jesus gets invited in by a Pharisee to have a meal, and a woman of ill repute, of, of a tarnished background, follows his, her, Jesus into the house and begins to, to bless him and worship at his feet. In verse 39, the Pharisee is offended by this. Luke 7, 39 says, Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw, it, saw this, he spoke to him saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would know who and of what manner of woman this is touching him, for she's a sinner. Now he's just thinking it. Now Jesus, discerning his thoughts, answered him saying, Simon, I have something to say to you. So he said, Teacher, say it. There was a certain creditor who had two, uh, who had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and another one 50. Now, in modern day translation, a uh, 500 denarii would be equivalent to 10,000 US dollars. And the other one owed him just 50, which would be equivalent to 1,000 US dollars. So one was forgiven $10,000, the other was forgiven 1,000. And when they had nothing to which to repay, he freely forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him more? And Simon answered and said, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. 
And he said to him, you have rightly judged. Then he turned to the woman and said, do you see this woman? I entered your house and you gave me no water uh, from, or excuse me, I entered your house and you gave me no water for my feet. But this, this woman, she has washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair of her head. You gave me no kiss, but this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since I came in. You did not anoint my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Therefore, I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Now, I think in this verse, uh, he who's forgiven much and he's forgiven little, I believe that's in the eye of the beholder. To the, to the point or revelation that you understand the gravity, the, the, the gravity to which you recognize the forgiveness that you've been afforded will be the measure by which you respond. Now this is the first parable. The next one is found in Matthew 18. Turn back just a couple of books. Now this one, what's interesting, Peter starts the conversation. I love Peter. Peter just speaks from the cuff. Most of us, if we're honest, we have a lot of Peter in us, and uh, we can relate to his, his, uh, his way. In verse number 21, Peter says, So he came to him, to Jesus, and said, Lord, how often shall my, shall, uh, my brother sin against me, and I forgive him? Up to seven times? Now you got to understand, Jesus, Jesus is being approached by Peter, and Peter is thinking big in his mind. Should I do it up to seven times? I mean, not just once, because once would have been good. You sin against me once, I forgive you. But should I do it up to seven? He's thinking this is a big number. So Jesus' response, uh, how about seven times 77 times, Peter? Put that in your pipe and smoke it. So he's, he's, trying to, he's trying to get all this in. Verse number 22, Jesus says, I did not say to you up to seven times, but up to 77 times. Or seven times 77 times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And when he had begun to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. Now, 10,000 talents is equivalent to 60 million denarii, or in U.S. dollars, we're talking $1.2 billion. This guy's, you know, rivaling with the U.S. government debt. I mean, he's got $1.2 billion in debt. Verse number 25. But as he was not able to pay his master, his master commanded that he be sold, along with his wife and his children, and all that they had, that the payment might be made. And the servant therefore fell down before him, saying, Master, have patience with me, and I will pay you all. And the master of the servant was moved with compassion. He released him and forgave him the debt. But that servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii, which is equivalent to 2,000 U.S. dollars. He had just been forgiven $1.2 billion, runs into a pal that owes him two grand, and how does he respond? And when he laid hands on him, he took him by the neck, saying, pay me what you owe. And so his fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him, saying, have patience with me, and I will pay you all. And he would not. But he went and threw him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servant saw what he had done, they were very grieved, and they came and told the master all that had been done. And then his master, after he had called him, said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all the debt because you begged me. Should you not also have compassion on your fellow servant, just as I had pity on you? And his master was angry, and he delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due to him. So, if you're a Christian today, somebody, a pastor, a friend, uh, someone who you know, has explained to you the gospel. You, you have heard the message of Jesus, the grace of God. And so often we hear the message and because we weren't there to see, because we didn't experience the price that was paid, grace and forgiveness comes to us very cheaply. But I'm here to tell you that the price and the grace that was provided cost Jesus everything. Because we don't appreciate the gravity or the amount that Jesus went through for you and for me, we often don't respond in a way like the man who was forgiven all the big debt. Jesus, when he was taken captive, he would have been starved and, and kept without water for a couple of days. Eventually, a, a Roman soldier would have brought him out in the public and stripped him of his clothes. Twofold. 
to embarrass him and to make sure that maximum pain would be inflicted to his body. Jesus, as custom was, was brought to a post or a stump where his hands were chained or tied around the stump. His feet were also tied or chained around the stump so that there was no wiggle room. There was no missing the beating he was about to receive. And so the crowd that was around the, 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 this, this flogging that was about to take place was a mixed bag of people. Some had been following Jesus for a long time, and some had a revelation that this is the God-man. They were convinced that, listen, go ahead, whip him, because uh, he's God. It's not even going to hurt his flesh. And so a, a soldier who was trained and in inflicting pain took a tool called, called the Cat of Nine Tails. It was just fashioned leather that had straps of leather that came off from it. And at the end of each one of these straps, there was either a piece of, of glass, a piece of stone, a piece of bone, or a piece of metal. Historians would say that when the, the soldiers would reach back and to travel as hard as they could to whip the whip, it whistled through the air. And then when it made contact with the person, it made a thump similar to hitting a drum. As the whip then slammed into the rib cage, hitting different various parts of the person's body, and then ripping back, flesh would have come off, and those that were watching would have been splattered with the blood of Jesus. So the, there was a mixture of emotion. Some would see this and begin to vomit. Some would begin to scream and cry, begging for them to stop, while whip after whip after whip is beating on the back, and not just on the back of Jesus, because you know they didn't have perfect aim. So some of these went around the rib cage, around to the abdomen, some to the neck, some to the face, and with every reaching back, his flesh was becoming tore apart. And under Jewish law, you were only allowed to beat a man 39 times, but it wasn't a Jew beating him. It was a Roman soldier. And in most cases, people would die at the flogging post before they ever made it to the torture tool called the cross. So Jesus' his stomach is ripped open. Some historians believe that his entrails are hanging out. And if his flesh was so badly beaten, Isaiah 52 says that Jesus wasn't even recognizable as a human being any longer. He's not smiling, blonde-haired Jesus on a cross like this. He was so brutalized, if that wasn't enough, the baking sun on his skin as he lays there, the bugs that are crawling in the wounds, then he's rolled over into the dirt where a heavy cross is not laid on him, forced to carry it up a hill where he can't make it. He's so diminished at this point that a man named Simon has to pick it up, carry it the rest of the way. So they get up under the hill where they're now going to crucify him to finish the job, and they take spikes and they run it in between the bones in his wrist, hitting the nerve that every, every few seconds the shearing pain would go up and down the shoulder, causing immense pain. And then turning the feet inside like this, they would typically run a spear through the Achilles tendon. Standing Jesus up, who's mutilated beyond imagination, they drop the tree into a hole, and the only thing that can protect him is the spikes in his wrists and his ankles, and he lands like this, and people are watching this. Now, this is the image. If it makes you sick, if it makes you gross out, it should. It's horrible what Jesus went through, and he did it for you and I. And I realize as I talk about offense, there are people that are here today that maybe you've been beaten, you've been raped, you've had murder in your families. And I understand, I'm not diminishing that point, but unless you've been beaten, I can look across this room and nobody has been so severely beaten like Jesus was. I know that we can forgive anyone for anything. I'm telling you, church, if we don't get a hold of this and understand the, 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 the poison that unforgiveness is to one of us, I watch as I teach the word from the pulpit. If I'm in the living room with someone and I'm, I'm teaching what the Bible says, and it's, it's like, it's, I can't get my head around it. There's one person sitting here. They're hearing what I say. They, they apply it, and it just seems effortless. The flow of God is just all over their life. They barely say amen before the answer is developing. And then I've got another person who they've, they're, they're hearing the same thing. They, they're seemingly applying the same thing. And they're not seeing the breakthrough that others are seeing. I'm not saying in every case, but I'm telling you, we need to check our hearts to see, is there unforgiveness in our lives? This is important. So why, why do we struggle to forgive? Because we don't have a system in place on how to handle it. People who go into business together don't typically go into business with someone they don't like. You don't sign a contract, go into business, and make a partnership with someone you don't like. People typically don't go into a marriage with someone they don't like or love. Right? But within the business, they often make contracts and clauses within that, an arbitration clause that signifies when and if there is an offense, 
Jesus said it was going to be impossible that offenses won't come. When and if there's an offense, this is how we are going to operate. There's a system in place. Let me tell you, as the leaders here at, at Believers, we have a covenant together that names off several things. One of those is a covenant agreement that we commit that we will, we will respond within 72 hours to an offense. We will, not let it, we will not let that thing grow up in us because I know the poison that comes from it. We, we make a, a commitment together that we are going to, uh, I said this Saturday night, let me clarify what I mean. We say that divorce is not an option. Now I realize there are people here today that have been through divorces. That's not what I'm saying. What I am saying is that it, we, we may go different ways. We may go do di different things, but we can do so in peace. We can go in God. We don't have to rip and tear and have a divorce separation. So there's a, there's a, there's a system in place in order to, uh, to move through and to get the offense away. If you are, already have your Bibles, look at Matthew chapter 5. Last week after the service, we were having a conversation of all things. A group of us were talking about making our bets. And I was joking about in my house, uh, my wife really wouldn't care if the bed is made during the day. She makes the bed before she gets into it. It's kind of an OCD thing. She wants it just laid out just right. But I'm the opposite. I'd rather have the bed made during the day and not make it all kinds of crazy messy when I get in. I got blankets everywhere, pillows everywhere. I'm okay with that. But the, that's chaos to my wife. Talking with someone else, that their their flow was they make the bed like a uh, like a mummy. I mean, some of y'all like to be tucked in like this, and you don't get to move. I hate that. I want like my my limbs hanging out, you know. The third one, and I won't reveal who you are, but it's a good it fits, fits for my message. One of them revealed that I'm not sure that I ever have really made the bed. They they have a a, a messy bed, but then they have this throw blanket that they just throw over at the start of the morning, and it has the, has the appearance of being made. And you know what? We're talking about blessing. We're talking about the flow of God going through your life. One person or, or two people that I can see very clearly that they see it in their lives, and then there's, there's some that they, they're doing what's right. They're church attenders. They're worshipers. They're tithers. They're Bible readers. They're quoting scripture to me, and yet we're not seeing it. Because I believe in some cases, those things can be like camouflage. Underneath the surface, there's a mess. And we've just covered it up with all of the churchism things that we do. So we're talking about a system in place before the offense comes. Because the offense will come. Matthew 5, 8 says, Bless Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. The word blessed there simply means happy. Happy are those who are pure in heart. I used to look at this verse and think, well, okay, I have a, a new heart because I'm a Christian. It's, it's pure, but that's not what the word means. The word pure there translates cathartic. It's where we get the English term or the medical term um, uh, catheter. A catheter once in place... Uh, if you if you uh, have one in, you no longer have to visit the restroom. When the, the bladder fills up, it just releases. It fills up again, and it, in order to get rid of the toxins, it releases automatically. Blessed, happy are those who have a catheter system in place to get the toxins out of the heart, for they shall see God. Now, I'm not saying you're not already blessed. But the, like Andrew said during worship, the presence of God, the Spirit of God, the kingdom of God resides inside the born-again spirit of any believer who's received Jesus. And so to get the, the presence, get the manifestation, to see what happened in here is to the level our minds are renewed. If you and I don't have a catheter in place, a system in place to get the toxicity out, we won't see the manifested presence of God in our lives. So why do we struggle then to forgive? Well, I think there's three primary reasons. Number one, injustice. I, I don't want someone just to get away with it. What they did was wrong. They, and so my defense mechanism, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be harsh, I'm gonna be mean. Anytime they come around, I'm gonna let them know by my body language. I, I'm gonna I'm going to hold on to this because I don't want you to get away with it. It was wrong of you. Maybe you've never felt that way. But I've been around where 
when that person or that group comes in the room, all of a sudden my emotions change? Who's the one in control of my emotional thermostat? They are. The second reason I think that we struggle to forgive is a misunderstanding of reconciliation. Many think that in order to forgive, I need to now go back to the state that it was. If a husband and wife enter a marriage contract together, marriage covenant together, we have a Bible reason. If a husband or wife steps out of that marriage and has an affair, there's a Bible reason for a divorce. So if that happened to you or is, does happen to someone, I still need to forgive the person who sinned against me. But that doesn't mean that I have to reconcile with them. That person that abused you, that person that hurt you, uh, you can forgive them and drop the charges without having to be chummy and best friends and go back to doing everything that you once did with them. Some of you are still wondering, is that possible? What about the offender that's not even alive today? They don't have to ask for forgiveness for you to give it. You still can drop the charges. The third one, it's a, an appearance of weakness. I, I don't like what they did. And I don't want them to think that it was okay. I don't want them to think I'm weak. I don't want to be bullied. I don't want them coming into my life and thinking they can just have their way. They can come in, rob my house, and I'm just going to carry the stuff out to their car with them, bless God, because I'm just going to forgive them. I'm a Christian. I'm not talking about milk toast Christianity. Do you know there's anger given by God as a gift to you and me? Ephesians 4.26 says, Be angry and sin not. Anger is a gift, a tool for you and I as a believer to respond. It's our fight or flight mechanism. If we didn't have people that came against us, we wouldn't do much. Do you know, when you eat food, there is some part of it that's nutritious, and the other part of it's waste. People who come and offend you, people who attack you, there is some nutritional value, but we need to know what to do with the waste to get out so it doesn't stay inside and poison us. So when we started Believers, I had people that said all kinds of crazy things. That this will never work. That, that made me angry. I pressed on. When people came against other people that I know and love and these things were happening, that anger caused a motivation within me, a response within me. But one, it's anger brings me to a place of rebuking or dealing with it where we get into trouble is when we hold on to anger. We need to do something with it. Can uh, we be my my, yeah, will you be my help? Come on up here, please. For those of you that don't know, this is my beautiful mother. Hard to believe I came out of this little lady, isn't it? <laughs> I, want to, I want you to do a demonstration for me. Just step right here. Go ahead and hit me in the arm. Don't do it too hard, please. But keep going. Keep hitting me. So, so long as she's hitting me, I can't forgive while the attack is still happening. So what am I supposed to do? Am I just supposed to be milk toast, milk toast Christian? Am I supposed to just be weak and let it? No, I get angry. And so what I do is I say, stop. <laughs> and she stopped. So now I have released it. I'm not holding on to it. The problem we get into, I need you for a second more. <laughs> Lift with your knees. It's heavy. Can you imagine going through the rest of the service having to hold that rock? How about going about your everyday life? Go greet some people trying to hold on to your rock. Go see a movie this afternoon holding on to the weight of this rock. Now, right now, it's, she's doing pretty good, but give it five minutes. Give it 30 minutes. Also, when God's wanting to bless her life, her hands are holding on to this root of bitterness. She's not receiving. She can't receive. So what does she do? She has to get rid of it. Let go of it. You see, if I'm offended, if, if she says something, does something to offend me, justified or not, she'll go about her everyday life and probably not even realize that I'm offended. Do you know I offend people nearly every week? Thank you. You can have a seat. I offend people nearly every, every week, and it's most of the time, it's so, it's so small, so misunderstood. I'll leave my office, come walking down the hallway. My mind is racing on a million things. Come around the corner. I've passed you by accident on the hallway, and you thought I ignored you. You thought I was mad at you, so I ignored you and didn't say something. 
Well, I've also, one of my favorite things to do in the whole service is to get out here, shake hands, and say hi and greet. I'm always up against the clock. So there are many weekends that I only get about three quarters of the way through and the service has got to start. I've had people offended that I didn't get to them and shake their hand. They thought I did it unintentional. So I didn't even know I did it. And if you're going to hold on to that and you walk out of this place, it's going to cripple your life. Even your everyday activities will become difficult. You'll lose sleep at night. It'll mess with you. So what do we what do we do? Let's go back to Luke 17, finishing the conversation that Jesus was having with his apostles. Now, I think that's important to point out because these were people that were elevated in title, elevated in authority, but they had immature understanding when it came to forgiveness. Proven by the fact that when he's talking a conversation about forgiveness, they said, increase our faith. Many people are say 30, 40 years old in their faith, but they might be five years old in their maturity because they're still hanging on to that first major offense. You know the type, and if you don't know the type, maybe you are the type, that <laughs> uber sweet. Man, Pastor Phil, I love you. I love this church. I want to do anything I can until you cross them. Then they become the nastiest, angriest person you ever met. Because they haven't dealt with that offense that happened to them all those years ago. Jesus responds and says to them, after he said, increase our faith. If I were to ask you, what is the definition of faith? Many of you share the same definition that I do. I believe faith is simply my positive response to what God's already provided by grace. My faith doesn't get God to move. It's me responding to what he's already provided. So I, can, I think that it applies in this particular verse. Lord, increase my faith. Increase my positive response to what you've given me so that I can now give that to others. So he says, increase, increase our faith. And the Lord said, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, sycamine tree. Now, I talk a lot about speaking to mountains. Many of us know, know the terminology. We take that from Matthew 21, 21. Jesus says, if you say to this mountain to be uplifted and cast into the sea, it has to listen. A mountain, in my mind, is an obstacle that's in my way, in the middle of my destiny. If it doesn't get out of the way, I can't continue to move forward. I get that. In our world, our modern day, we have tools. We have excavation equipment that we can bore through, blow through, knock down mountains. But in their day, they didn't have any of that kind of stuff. So it's very supernatural. Agreed? But a tree... They had the ability, even in the Bible day, to get a tree out of the way. They had saws. So why in the world would he respond to the, the statement or the request, increase my faith, and then say, if you speak to this sycamine tree, be uprooted and planted into the sea? I'll tell you why. Because mountains don't have roots. I have about 50 pine trees on my property and uh, a couple years ago, I, I, uh, I saw this little maple tree budding up in between my trees. And, you know, I probably couldn't intentionally grow a maple tree to save my life. But how they can find their way in there and grow really well. So I, I'd get in there and I'd snip it off and pull this little sapling tree out of there. And guess what happened? It came back. Because I didn't deal with the root. It was a lot harder getting in there, digging that root up, and getting that tree dealt with. So Jesus is saying, you need faith. We're talking about forgiveness or unforgiveness. You need to say to this tree, be thou uprooted and be planted into the sea. If you and I don't deal with the root, anger will turn into bitterness. Look at Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15. If you put the New King James up first for me looking carefully lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness spring up and cause trouble, and by this many become defiled. Look at the New Living Translation. It says, you look after each other so that none of you fails to receive the grace of God. Watch out that no poisonous root of bitterness grows up to trouble you, corrupting many. Well, how in the world... Does a 
bitter root of unforgiveness corrupt anyone else but me? I mean, it's in me anyway. It's the poison is within me. How is it that I'm going to corrupt others? Well, without a catheter, a system in place, there is no release to get the poison out. There is, medically speaking, if you have a blockage in your digestive system, in your colon, and you continue to eat, that waste will continue to build up. And if the problem, the dysfunction isn't fixed, that waste will come out of your mouth. If you do not, now let's look at it spiritually, if you do not deal with the bitter root of unforgiveness that's in you, it will grow up and begin to come out of everything that you say, everyone you talk to, everywhere you go, you're spewing this poison on everyone. I'm a person of influence. And so if I have a root of bitterness within me, I can share it with hundreds of people every weekend and poison the ears of people. And listen, there are lots of pastors who are preaching not from a, a godly conviction, bless God. No, they're, they're preaching and screaming from a place of woundedness. And there's a difference. If you don't deal with the root or have a system in place for this poison to get out of you, it will build up and not only destroy your life, it will destroy everything around you. I am convinced that the number one thing that's keeping the flow, the blessing of God in, from in your coming out and manifesting in your life is unforgiveness. And even right now, you're still, some of you are hanging on to it going, I just can't do it. This guy has no idea what I've been through. So if your response is that, this is exactly what you're saying. The men to ask Jesus, increase our faith. If you can't release that person, what you're saying is that I am going to continue to carry my rock. And I have more faith in the ability of the person who wounded me in my past than I have faith that Jesus can fix my present. I need my faith to be increased. And what Jesus has provided for me, no longer do I need to live in the place where that person, that person, that thing, that event, is the controller of the thermostat. No, I'm going to take control back, which is the fruit of the Spirit. That means that I'm the one who dictates the control of my emotions. So when they come in the room, they come up in the conversation, that memory comes back and it will try. I'm the one in the control of how I respond to it. I need to have more faith in Jesus' ability to deliver me. Then that person is going to dictate my life without offense, whatever it was. Another day of my life. Folks, we've got to get a hold of this. So talking about unforgiveness, I would be doing you an in-service or injustice if I said, okay, we need to do it without a how to do it. I came across a response, a written response by President Abraham Lincoln. He was, he was asked the question, what is it that you will do first when the war is ended? And his response was, I will respond in a spirit of forgiveness. I want to read to you his response, and this is what I want you to do. I'd like you to close your eyes. And it's my heart's desire this morning that these words would become a mantra for us. That these words would be something that we would recite again and again as we move forward in this, in this day, in the upcoming week, the upcoming months. Jesus said the offenses, it's impossible that they won't come. He's saying it in such a way that it's going to be on the regular, guys. It's like eating food. Some of you ate breakfast this morning because you were hungry. That doesn't mean that you're not going to be hungry again tomorrow. The offense will come again tomorrow. You need to know, how do I get rid of the poison? The president writes this. He says, I will greet this day with a forgiving spirit. For too long, every ounce of forgiveness I owed was locked away, hidden from view, waiting for me to bestow its precious presence upon some worthy person. Alas, I found most people to be singularly unworthy of my valuable forgiveness. And since they never asked for any, I kept it all for myself. Now the forgiveness that I hoarded has sprouted inside me, like uh, inside of my heart, like a crippled seed yielding bitter fruit. No more. At this moment, my life has taken on new hope and new assurance. 
Of all the world's population, I am the one, I am one of the few possessors of the secret to dissipating anger and resentment. I now understand that forgiveness has value only when it's given away. By the simple act of granting forgiveness, I release the demons of the past about which I can do nothing, and I create in myself a new heart, a new beginning. I will greet this day with a forgiving spirit. I will forgive even those who do not ask for forgiveness. Many are the times when I have seethed in anger at a word or deed thrown in my life by an unthinking, uncaring person. I have wasted valuable hours imagining revenge and confusion. Now I see the truth revealed about the psychological rock inside my shoe. The rage I nurture is often one-sided for my offender seldom gives thought to his offense. I will now and forevermore silently offer my forgiveness even to those who do not see that they need it. By the act of forgiving, I am no longer consumed by unproductive thoughts. I give up my bitterness. I am content in my soul and effective again with my fellow man. I will greet this day with a forgiving spirit. I will forgive those who criticize me unjustly, knowing that slavery in any form is wrong. I also know that the person who lives a life according to the opinion of others is a slave, and I am not a slave. I have chosen my counsel. I know the difference between right and wrong. I know what is best for the future of my family, and neither misguided opinion nor unjust criticism will alter my course. Those who are critical of my goals and dreams simply do not understand the higher purpose to which I have been called. Therefore, their scorn does not affect my attitude or action. I forgive their lack of vision and I forge ahead. I now know that criticism is part of the price paid for leaping past mediocrity. I will greet this day with a forgiving spirit. I will forgive myself. For many years, my greatest enemy has been myself. Every mistake, every miscalculation, every stumble I made has been replayed again and again in my mind. Every broken promise, every, wasted, uh, every day wasted, every goal not reached has compounded the disgust that I feel for the lack of achievement in my life. My dismay has developed a paralyzing grip. When I, dis when I disappoint myself, I respond with inaction and become more disappointed. I realize today that it is impossible to fight an enemy in my head. By forgiving myself, I erase the doubts the fears and frustrations that have kept my past in the present. From this day forward, my history will cease to control my destiny. I have forgiven myself. My life has just begun. I will forgive even those who do not ask for forgiveness. I will forgive those who criticize me unjustly. I will forgive myself. I will greet this day with a forgiving spirit. Would you stand with me? Jesus spoke very few words while he was being tortured. He spoke even fewer when he was on the cross. But in the moments leading up to the end of his life, Jesus had the strength to look out at all those who had tortured him, all those that had abused him and put him in that position. And he said the words, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Jesus forgave your sins and mine nearly 2,000 years ago before you ever knew to ask for it. It's our simple response to what he provided for us today that we get to enjoy freedom. We're not slaves, but if we harbor unforgiveness, we become a slave to that person, that memory, that event. Some of you are slaves to yourselves still, struggling to forgive yourselves for decisions made. That's not any less of an issue than forgiving someone who's harmed you that's not you. So if you let me pray with you, Father, across this room, we're talking about a new beginning, a fresh start. Many of us struggle to see the blessings and the flow of God in our lives. And the blessings that I, I want to first address are not just the natural needs and the the monetary things that we often think of as blessings, but there are those that are absent this morning of peace. 
absent this morning of hope. You're losing sleep at night because of this unrest, this unsettledness in you, this rock that you're carrying around. Jesus is the fresh start. The one who provides peace. The one who provides the hope. He's the missing link that you're looking for. He's the source and supply that you need. So it first starts with you saying, I believe that Jesus is sufficient. A fresh start begins with receiving Jesus. This morning, if that's you, if you've never responded to the love of God, you've never responded to what Jesus has provided for you, today is your day. Don't miss this opportunity. If you've never asked the Lord to be the Lord of your life, I want to pray with you. If you just slip up your hand so I know who I'm praying with. I see your hands. Is there anyone else? Church, let's pray this together. I see your hand too. Say, Father, I thank you for Jesus. Thank you for dying for me, for paying for my sin, offering me forgiveness. I receive it today. Make me brand new. Empower me to follow you and to know you all of my days. In Jesus' name, amen. With your eyes still closed in this in the atmosphere of prayer, now everyone here, if you said that prayer even for the first time, you're a new creation, brand new. The process of walking this out is a journey. But I believe there are some of us that have been walking in this pain of, of hurt and disgust and, and, and unforgiveness, and you need to purge it. Don't leave this place carrying the rock any longer. You need to drop the charges. And this is going to encourage us all. Forgiveness is not a feeling. It's a thing. If I walked outside and cut a branch off the tree that's next to the church, and I held it in my hand, the leaves don't instantly fall off. But that branch is dead. It just doesn't know it yet. When you will intentionally forgive, when you will intentionally drop the charges, your emotions will line up when you speak to that thing. That memory, that hurt has been dealt with. It's dead. It just doesn't know it yet. So we remind it. We speak to it again. I've already dropped the charges. I've forgiven. I'm allowing that grace to do its work in my heart. I'm not going to live in my past any longer. Help us right now, Holy Spirit, to release, to purge the toxin, the poison, the root of this out of our bodies, out of our memory. And we receive the washing, the renewing, the freedom, the chains are being removed that we can walk in this week, this day, this month, the remainder of our lives free as we learn to purge the toxin. We don't take the offense, we reject it. Lord, I just declare a blessing over each one as we go out into our week, the areas of our influences, including our homes, our neighborhoods, and our jobs. You have placed people that are there for us to be a blessing to. Give us the boldness to respond when we see a need. Give us a word to share, Lord, that we could demonstrate your love. I thank you, Lord, that everywhere we go, we're salt and light, that we manifest the kingdom. Thank you for first starting in us. As a response, Lord, to your generosity, your love to us, we can freely give it away. I declare it and I seal this now in Jesus' name. We pray that you are blessed by this message. If you are curious about our ministry or would like to talk to someone, you can contact us through our website, BelieversChristianChurch.com.